Episode 8, August 9th to the 18th, 1914. Birth of a World Song by George C. Kernock, a correspondent of the Daily Mail in France, 1914 to 1918. Read by Grant Shaw. George Kernock, a famous war correspondent, was in Boulogne when the secret landing of the old contemptibles was taking place. He describes that moving scene and relates how the strains of Tipperary, resounding through the ancient streets, gave immortality to that simple song. When I decided to spend my summer holiday at Hardelow, a little plage near Boulogne, in July and August 1914, I little thought that it would end in the writing of dispatches recording the landing of the first British troops and the first singing in France of Tipperary, the soldiers' song of the Great War. Our first forecast of war came when Germans of military age packed their trunks and took their children from the sands of Hardelow. I realised during that last week of July that the war, so long anticipated, was coming at last. In 48 hours the invasion of Belgium began. By wire I sought and obtained my editor's permission to remain in France as correspondence of the Daily Mail at Boulogne. I found Boulogne seething with emotion. Reservists were pouring in from the countryside. Among the English who remained, as I did, there was one consuming topic of conversation. Would England come in? On August the 4th the die was cast. England came in. The only question then was, when will they come over? A deep veil of secrecy hiding Britain's intentions was partially rent when a number of French officers arrived very smart in their uniforms of cavalry, artillery, engineers and the line and turned me out of my comfortable quarters at the Hotel Crystal facing the harbour. The same evening, having found a refuge in Boulogne's little Hotel Metropole, I met these French officers on the terrace of the town's smartest café. To my surprise, they all spoke English with a fluency which betokened long acquaintance with the language. They were, I soon discovered, interpreters detailed for service with the British troops. My luck was in. We in Boulogne were to see the arrival of the first British troops on French soil, the first to land horse, foot and artillery for 100 years. 1815 to 1914, how the pendulum of time had swung in 100 years. Nearly a quarter of a century has passed, but still I think with emotion of these Frenchmen, leaving their homes, their friends, their sport and their business in England to help British troops to fight for France and Belgium. Hardly a month was to pass before one at least was to give his life, riding and fighting with the English cavalry at Toulon in Belgium. A gallant officer, the Vicomte de Vauvineux, known to many in English society of that day. Another, Captain Le Touré, French master at Blundell's school at Tiverton in Devon, riding by the Vicomte's side with the Ninth Lancers, escaped death in that wonderful charge when Lancers, Dragoons and Hussars, forming the Second Cavalry Brigade, charged the German guns, as Le Touré afterwards told me, singing and shouting like schoolboys. Le Torre's horse was shot under him. What happened to the rest of the interpreters, with whom I had spent so many pleasant evenings in Boulogne, I never heard. One was a Birkenhead and Liverpool cotton merchant. Another had spent years with his shipping firm in Newcastle. Another practised at the English bar. Another had hunted for years with the Pitchley. Another was a man of leisure. And the eighth of this little band was a former attaché, at the French Embassy in London. Peace to their memory, they were the first to help the English on French soil. Apart from staff officers and army servicemen, who came to prepare the way, but, like everyone else, had their fill of fighting before the war ended, the first fighting unit to land was a detachment of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. How strong and sturdy, sunburned and gay they looked, khaki-clad but kilted, with knees bare and pipes skirling. Among my Hardelow acquaintance was a nephew of that old Scottish golfer, Andrew Kirkcaldy. Himself a golf professional with the Hardelow club, the younger Kirkcaldy had served in his youth with the A&S, and nothing could stop him from joining up again 
when he heard the pipes and saw the lads. The battalion doctor rejected him daily. Peacetime rules regarding teeth and other impediments to perfect manhood still held good, but the colonel took him. All Boulogne belonged to Kirkcaldy when he was allowed to join again. His joy was great, his glory brief. Before Christmas came, Kirkcaldy's name was on another roll of honour. Six long days passed, and then the British came, heralded by a notice on the walls of Boulogne which put the old town into a fervour of anticipation. Signed at the Hotel de Ville on August the 10th, 1914, by Felix Adam, the mayor, and countersigned by a grizzled veteran of the War of 1870, Daru, military governor, this notice read as follows. Arrival of the British troops. Appeal to the inhabitants. My dear citizens, this day arrive in our town the valiant British troops who come to cooperate with our brave soldiers to repel the abominable aggression of Germany. So before the invasion of the barbarians, all Europe rose against the light race who menaced the peace of the world and the security of other people. Boulogne, which is one of the homes of the Entente Cordiale, will give to the sons of the United Kingdom an enthusiastic and brotherly welcome. The citizens are requested, on this occasion, to decorate the fronts of their houses with the colours of the two countries. Boulogne burst into a display of bunting. The flags of Great Britain, France and Belgium were everywhere on the houses and across the streets. There were sad hearts and grave faces among many who put out the flags, for already the 8th Boulonnais Regiment had called up its reservists and sent them away to Belgium with a kiss and a prayer for each, and the rumour that the regiment had been hard hit in the bloody fighting in the north was rife. The 10th of August 1914 was a Monday. More than a week was to pass, so strict was the censorship, before the British public was allowed to know what we and Boulogne were going crazy about. On Monday night, August 17th, at 9.45pm, the official press bureau in London issued the following notice, which sent a great thrill through England and, indeed, the whole world. The expeditionary force as detailed for foreign service, has been safely landed on French soil. The embarkation, transportation and disembarkation of men and stores were alike carried through with the greatest precision without a single casualty. Without a single casualty. The phrase was hardly to be used again during four years. So they came. Down at the Bassin Lube, I saw the ships of every burden from Atlantic liners to coasting craft pouring out their living freight and the spotless equipment which came with it, shining guns and polished leather so soon to be camouflaged with the mud of Flanders. The Middlesex Regiment was one of the first. Many said they had never seen a finer battalion of the line. Every man was in fighting trim, seasoned and hard as nails, Reservists were there in amazing numbers, many wearing the South African Boer War ribbon. One tough-looking, bold-headed private told me he came from Oxton and that he lived next to the Prince of Wales' feathers, and what he was going to do to the Kaiser and the whole of the German army hardly bears repetition. As these Londoners passed the railings of the depot behind which the Argyll and Sutherlandshire detachment were clustered, the kilties from Scotland hurled at them their old football cry, Are we downhearted? And back came the thunderous roar, No! Boulogne caught the phrase, and the next day, as battalion after battalion of Worcesters, Royal Scots, Gordons, Highland Light Infantry, and Connaught Rangers, and many other famous regiments landed, the townspeople called it again. But Oxford and Bucks varied the cry with their own slogan, Shall we win? And back came the answer, yes. On Thursday, August the 13th, came Boulogne's great day. In glorious sunshine, the British troops, hitherto quartered in and around the docks, made a set march through the town to their camps on the hills. To watch them pass, we took our places in the doorstep of the Hotel Metropole. Beside me stood Madame and her three little children, clothed in the deepest mourning, Rumour had spoken too truly of the fate of the town's reservists. Her husband and the children's father had gone with the 8th Boulonnais, never to return. Dead on the field of honour was the official message. 
Enthusiasm redoubled on both sides as the men passed on foot, while their officers rode quietly between. Company after company, battalion after battalion, they swung up the Rue Fade Herbe and the steep Grande Rue, shouting their slogans, whistling and singing their songs. How familiar the songs were. I had heard them often from when these regiments came back from the Boer War. The soldiers of the Queen, my lads, who've seen my lads. And now the great old Queen was gone, and George V reigned in her stead. But still they sang it with, Goodbye, Dolly, I must leave you. What men they were. Not a youth or a stripling among them, I wrote in the Daily Mail. Their shirts are open at the front, and as they shout, you can see the working of the muscles of their throats, their wide open mouths and rows of dazzling teeth. English and French alike rejoiced in the sight, but Madame remained silent, watching and thinking of Flanders and days to come. For an hour she said not a word. Then quietly she turned to me as a company of the 2nd Battalion Connaught Rangers passed us singing, with a note of strange pathos in their rich Irish voices, a song I had never heard before. As she turned, Monsieur, she said, what are they singing? Madame, said I, it is a song new to me, a popular air, as we say, of the music hall. But the words, she replied, tell me the words. Again I listened as another company of the Connaught Rangers passed us, still singing their plaintive ballad. They sing, I said, it's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go. Catching her throat with a sudden impulsive gesture, seeming to choke in rising sobs, she answered, Ah, oh, the poor boys, a long, long way. They do not know how long is the way they are going. How long? How long? She was again silent, and then, mistress of her own grief, she added, It makes me sick at heart to see so many fine men marching to the war. They are so full of life. Never have I seen such splendid men. Oh, but they are brave to go laughing. When that afternoon I came to write this story of the landing in this march, I set aside the old songs and named only this one song sung by the Connaught Rangers. To me it seemed to fill and complete the picture as no other song could do. When it arrived in London, the censor, cutting out a great deal, allowed this story of Tipperary to pass. The Daily Mail printed it and gave Tipperary, in a few hours, worldwide fame. From that day, August 18th, 1914, Tipperary was played and sung everywhere, even in Germany. Chinese brought to France for work behind the lines had their version. Every soldier of Kitchener's army sang it on a route march and arrived in France singing it. Tipperary was played second to our national anthem in France and Belgium throughout the war and is still played in both countries on every occasion in which British soldiers figure as on the dedication of the men in gate. Canada set her own words to the tune, and though the American troops when they came had their song, Tipperary penetrated to every state, as it did to every British dominion. After that first great march, the troops passed daily to their camps on the hills, the very sites on which Napoleon's army for the invasion of England had camped not more than 100 years before. Then came the day when our troop ships went elsewhere than to Boulogne Harbour. Mons had been fought. The combined armies of France and England were southwards on the Marne and beyond. Only a few poor broken men of the thousands we had seen came back to Boulogne. The camps were deserted. Not a man of military age remained in the town except the gendarmes. Boulogne was an open town. The guns of 1870 were taken from the castle walls. With my colleague of the Times, I remained at the little Hotel Metropole. Not a soldier of the Allied forces stood between us and the Germans. Each night we said, Tomorrow the Uhlans will be here. Each morning we expected to be awakened by the sound of their horses' hooves clattering over that same granite roadway which had resounded so recently and so bravely to the march of the British troops. One English officer, a major in the reserves, alone remained at the Hotel Crystal, the coolest man in Boulogne. Will they reach Paris? I asked him one morning. No, said he, the French will take care of that. But how can they be stopped? I asked, when they learned to do what we had to do in South Africa. And that was? To dig in, he replied. Fighting in the open is no good nowadays. 
you must go underground. No troops can stand in the open against modern gunfire. And so it was. After the Battle of the Ork, which saved Paris, and the Battle of the Marne, which drove the Germans to the banks of the Aisne, both sides dug in. The first phase was over. Thank you.